to the series. In the last lesson, we looked at how automatic verifications helped make our application more secure from attacks. Let's apply those lessons to our rock, paper, scissors program. Since we've been making a lot of changes to the code, we'll start with a fresh new version of the reach program. We'll write every single line again as a review. To start off, we'll define the rules of rock, paper, scissors a little more abstractly. This means we'll separate the theoretical logic of how the game is played from the more specific details of how it actually works in Reach. Instead of using 0, 1, and 2 for the outcome in hands, we'll use something called an enum. An enum is a set of predefined values. For the hand, that'll be rock, paper, and scissors. The real value of these will be 0, 1, and 2, but now they're abstracted, and we can simply refer to them as rock, paper, and scissors instead of those numbers. By using abstraction here, we make our code easier to read. We'll also create an enum for the outcomes of the game. Now enums work a little special in reach because we also get a free function that lets us check whether a given item is one of the enums. The output of make enum is one checker function and the three values, 0, 1, and 2. To name this checker function, we simply add it as part of the tuple. That's what we call these values in the square brackets. We'll call it is hand. For the outcomes, we'll call it is outcome. Another change we'll make is instead of computing the winner in line later on in the program, we'll create a function that calculates the winner given two hands. To create a function in reach, we'll need to give it a name. We'll call it winner. It'll have two inputs, hand A and hand B. It'll use these inputs to calculate the winner. As for the body of the function, or the implementation of it, we actually already know what to do. We'll use the same mathematical formula from before. The equal arrow sign separates the inputs of the function from the implementation of the function. We have our inputs A and B, and then we have what the function does this calculation. Now when we first created rock, paper, scissors, we trusted this formula. We trusted it was correct. But it's actually good to check. One way to check would be to implement a JavaScript front-end that uses specific testing values and we could check that the output is as expected. We could run one test where hand A was rock and hand B was scissors. We could run another test where it should be a time and so on. We would refer to these as individual test cases, and it's a typical way to debug and test your code in other programming languages. It's also possible with Reach. In fact, Reach allows us to write test cases like these directly into the Reach program as assertions. Let's try it out. We'll use an assertion statement and assert whatever's in the parentheses is true, Otherwise, the program will not compile. We'll assert that when player A is rock and player B is scissors, B should win. Paper beats rock. We'll also write an assertion for when A should win. And we'll do one for a draw. With these assertions, we don't have to check that our program is working as expected. It's literally built into the program. In fact, Reach's automatic verification allows us to express even more powerful statements about the program's behavior. For example, we can state that no matter what the values are for hand A and hand B, the winner function will always provide a valid outcome. We can do this using something called a for all loop. A for all loop allows us to loop through all the possible values for a given variable. Here, we'll say all the possible hands for hand A, so any uint or unsigned number. We'll also loop through all the possible hands for hand B. 
No matter what the hand A is or what the hand B is, we'll assert that the winner function always is a valid outcome. So we'll call is winner and feed it into is outcome. This should be true in all cases. We can also specify that whenever the hands are the same value, no matter what that value is, the winner function will always return a draw. Now since the hand will be the same for both A and B, we can just create one for all loop and it'll use the same hand variable as input for the winner function. We'll create this variable on the fly using this loop. For a given hand, that's the value for both hands, we'll assert the outcome is a draw. Whatever is in between the parentheses of an assert statement must return true. That's why we have to use an equality here. For the previous assertion, is outcome already returns true or false, depending on whether the outcome of winner is a valid outcome value. Now both of these examples use for all. This allows you to quantify over all the possible values that might be provided as a part of your program. So you might be thinking these theorems will take a very long time to prove. They have to loop over billions and billions of possibilities for the uint value. However, on regular laptops, this computation takes less than half a second. That's because Reach uses an advanced symbolic execution engine. It reasons about this theorem abstractly without considering individual values. Let's continue this program. We'll specify the participant interact interfaces for Alice and Bob. Previously, these were in the form of a player. We had a get hand function and a see outcome function. Now most of this will stay the same, but we're adding one element, has random. Previously, we expected that the front end would have an implementation for get hand and see outcome, but now we're also expecting the front end to provide access to random numbers. Jumping over to the front end, the way they'll provide random numbers is through the reach standard library. All we have to do is modify the front end's implementation of player. The has random function will allow each front end to generate random numbers as necessary. We say each front end because Alice and Bob will actually interact using their own front ends generated from the front end we define. We'll see this more later on in the series, but both Alice and Bob should be able to provide random numbers. Now these two changes of adding has random to the front end and has random to the back end actually mean very different things. When we add has random to the reach program, we add it to the interface that the back end expects the front end to provide. When we add has random to the front end, we're adding an implementation that the front end provides to the back end. Let's create the participants and deploy the application. This will be the same as before. All right, so now we're at the crucial part where we need to protect Alice's hand before Bob reveals his hand. Let's write out Alice's step. We need Alice to be able to publish her hand, but we also need to keep it a secret. We can do this using Reach's built-in make commitment function. This uses cryptography so we can hide the hand from Bob. We'll make a commitment using the interact object, as well as the value we want Alice to commit to. That's her hand. Now make commitment outputs two things the commitment and the salt value. These are both known only to Alice and the salt value will be revealed later on in the program. 
It's important that the salt is included in the commitment so that multiple commitments to the same value are not identical. It's also important not to share the salt value until later because it can be used to learn the value of the hand. But what is this salt? The salt value itself is actually just a random number. In fact, make commitment uses the random function we just added to the interact object in order to generate it. Now let's declassify the commitment and publish the commitment instead of Alice's hand. Alice has committed to a hand, but the hand itself and the salt value are hidden from Bob. We can confirm this by using an unknowable assertion. We'll say the following are unknowable to Bob. That's Alice's hand and Alice's salt. Then we'll publish Bob's hand. This will be the same as the previous version. The only difference is that we'll commit Bob's hand. We have to commit Bob's hand because the consensus network doesn't know Alice's hand yet. It only knows that Alice made a commitment to a certain hand. Let's have Alice reveal her secrets. We'll have Alice declassify the salt and her hand and publish it. Then, we can check that the published values match the original values. We'll use check commitment. We'll feed in the commitment, the salt value, and Alice's hand. This means that Alice's hand should match the hand provided in the commitment. This will always be the case with honest participants, but dishonest participants may violate this assumption. The rest of the program will be unchanged from the original version, except we'll use the new abstracted names for the outcomes instead of numbers. We'll also use our new winner function to compute the outcome. We didn't change the front end much, so the format of the output we see in the console will remain the same. Let's compile it. And it compiles. Let's run it. Although the output pretty much looks the same, we made so many changes. Without any modifications to the front end, we were able to protect Alice from Bob finding out her hand. We also made it so that Alice takes two local steps instead of just one. When we compile this version of the application, Reach's automatic verification engine proves so many theorems. It protects us from a plethora of mistakes we might make even when writing a simple application like this. Now this implementation of rock, paper, scissors is secure, and it doesn't contain any exploits for either Alice or Bob to guarantee a win. However, it still has a final category of error that's common in decentralized applications, non-participation. We'll fix this in the next lesson, so make sure you don't launch with this version. Otherwise, Alice might decide to back out of the game when she knows she's going to lose. Thank you again to Algorand and Reach for sponsoring the series. If you have any questions about blockchain development, please join me in the Reach Discord in the Days of Blockchain channel. I'll see you next time, and happy coding!